7 o'clock mountain time in beautiful downtown Santa Fe. The skies are blue, it's clear, it's a gorgeous day. And today we're here to celebrate Richard Zane Smith. Not only his beautiful work, but also his beautiful pottery. And thank you so much for tuning in. It's the 20th of August and it's also Richard's birthday. So we are just absolutely delighted to welcome you to this wonderful occasion. Richard has constructed all of these incredible pieces uh, for this show that we're having here today. And uh, it's gonna be really fun to be able uh, to talk to him and, uh, and, and for you to be able to see how he makes all this beautiful work. But for one, for one uh, comment here, we, ha we have a, a show continuing, uh, which started two days ago, the work of Sandra Victorino. She is our featured potter in the show called Women of Distinction. Women of Distinction is in four parts, with Sandra uh, being the living artist, with um, Doris Sepe, Jackie Stevens, and Jean Sami who are also alive but no longer working, and all of them for health reasons. We have the third part, which is about some of the greatest people, the greatest women potters that have ever lived. And the fourth part deals with, unfortunately, those that we have lost to COVID. Though all those pieces are online for you to take a look at, but I know that one of the wonderful things about these uh, videos that we've done is actually being able to talk to the artists. And, uh, and I am just delighted that Richard Zane Smith, who is Wyandotte, for those of you unfamiliar with the Wyandotte tribe, the Wyandots live in the northeast corner of Oklahoma. So come and join me and we will head off to see Richard and his demonstration. The new world of video. Hey, Cindy, <laughs> how are you? Hey. <laughs> Folks, may I introduce uh, Richard Zane Smith, master potter, master coiler, a man of distinction, and one who is celebrating his birthday. Yay! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, how are you doing, Richard? Pretty good, pretty good. Not too bad. Standing upright. Not, Standing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. upright. Hallelujah. No illness, no problems. No, nope. nope. so far, so far so good. And how was the trip out from Oklahoma? Um, a lot of truckers on the road. A lot of truckers? A lot of truckers. Well, you know, the uh, distribution system in this country has been interrupted for a while, Man. so it's good that all those boys are back to work. Boy, I, I should say boys and girls are yep. back to work. That's true. Yeah, so tell me what you're doing there. Well, I'm just adding coils to this piece right here um, and as I build I'm just shingle lapping basically the coils shingle lapping yeah so I'm, the next coil will go over this 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 coil right here so um, let me give I'll just give a little now when did you start that pot uh, I started this one about nine about nine o'clock yeah so just to bring it up this is three hours worth of work yeah. Which will give you an idea how long it takes to make all these pieces so the, of pottery. So the first, or the coil, the next coil will be added like that. And it's always added below the, the, um, th this rim here, the ridge. So that allows for no uh, seams on the inside. Oh, so this uh -huh. will, That way all the seams are always on the outside. Uh, well, it's those seams that you're noted for. 
Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Outside scenes. And if you, well, if, and you know, if you couldn't see the scale at home of these coils, I always tease Richard that someday I'm going to bring in a sack of flour and a dozen eggs, and we're going to have the <laughs> best spaghetti lunch that anyone could imagine as he rolls out his One. little angel hair pasta really? size coils. One I mean, spaghetti at a time. One <laughs> spaghetti at a time. So what you're looking at is, what, four, four hours, three, no, excuse me, three, three hours, nine to, nine nine to, to, 11. to 11, two hours worth of work. Oh, you know, with Indian market, time has no meaning anymore. <laughs> now, how long have you been doing this, Richard? Um, well, full time since 1984, I believe, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a while. A lot of coil, a lot of coils. A lot of <laughs> coils. Then. Well, I wonder how many times the coils could reach to the moon and back. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think wrap anyone around the earth. We wrap see. around the earth. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you think yeah. about an old car I used to have, and when it was time to trade it in, I realized that I had driven it all the way around the earth <laughs> at the equator. <laughs> and so, where did where did you learn? Well. It seemed like this particular technique is something I picked up um, in the 70s, late 70s. Uh, I was at a, was working as an art teacher at this little Navajo school, and they gave me $50 for the year uh, for art supplies. For yeah. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so I had to be pretty creative. And had so, to fill the time. And I'd already been working with clay, so I'd, I'd had some experience with clay ever since high school. Uh, I hadn't done much hand building really. I, I mean, I'd, they always start you out with hand building, but uh, I was I was just dying to get on the potter's wheel because that's what you know I was just just lusting for watching those kids you know on the wheel and that's what I wanted to do. So really, I had kind of been ignoring any hand building, but out there um, I was kind of stuck. I didn't have equipment or anything like that, but. We did have a desert, and the desert had clay in it. And so some of the, the, the kids and I, we'd get in the, uh, they'd get in the back of the truck, and we'd drive out, to the, out, out in the desert getting clay. And that's where I started seeing a lot of the, the corrugated pottery sherds that are just laying out there. And, you know, of course, my first fascination was they were seeing the fingerprints in the clay. And, you know, right away, just identifying with that, you know, these potters who've been doing this and then realizing they were, they could be 900 years old. So that was something that just really compelled me. I thought, I got to figure out how they did this because I'd never seen that technique before. And uh, so I, I would uh, study it, pick up these sherds and look at it. I finally found a rim sherd, which like, oh, okay, so this is how they go, you know. I didn't, I mean, when you just find a sherd with corrugation yeah. on it, you don't know is what the it, orientation is. This way, is. That, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, with a rim shirt, you know, I started to see. And then looking at the sides, you, you could actually see the way the layers, the way the clay was put in. And I realized, oh, my gosh, these guys are shingle lapping the coils. They're not, they're not stacking them like this. You know, they're, they're actually shingle lapping. So I thought, I've never tried that before. And I wonder if that works. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, you know, I started doing it um, between my time as a teacher, I'd just be making pottery on my own. And, and so I, that's kind of where the technique started for me. Um, we were doing a lot of all kinds of stuff, though. I mean, you know, I, I, I told the older boys, I said, there's a dead cow out there, you know, maybe we can use part of the hide, you know, because, I mean, it's dry, you know, and so we cut off the hide and made a war shield and uh, it was a little smelly. And the kid, the guy was <laughs> a little really, smelly. Yeah, it was a little <laughs> smelly. But it, it worked, you know. But it was one. Of, it was those days, you know, and that's where it all happened. Wow. Well, and, you um, use what you have. Well, yeah. with this corrugated ware, um, Richard, have you heard any, you know, final decisions about why corrugated ware was made? Because I've heard lots of different options. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of. There's a lot of speculation. I think people thought maybe it uh, actually gave more surface area so that, you know, it would cook, boil water yeah, faster. Yeah, they were used as cooking pots. Right. Yes, uh -huh. that's right. These were, they were used for cooking pots. So 
and they were usually a little more underfired than the black on white stuff. Uh, so it's they were obviously made for that purpose. Um, there's I, I don't think anybody was in a hurry back in those days. You know, I don't think that surface, like, oh, if we do it this way, we'll get the, the soup cooked five minutes faster. You know, yeah. so I don't and, think that was a big concern. Of the, you know. and, and also you didn't waste your time, like, looking for your car keys or watching the news on TV. <laughs> right. So uh, I don't think that really holds weight. I think there's actually been some experiments that show that, uh, you know, that they don't really heat up the water much faster. And it also, it's a, it's a technique that works really well with the Southwest somehow. You can, because you can continually build, you know, even with soft clay, you can just keep going because the bottom part starts drying and it, it supports the, the, the top. So you're never just adding a big fat coil like this and then having yeah. to worry, well, this has got to be really hard or firm first. You don't have to worry about that so much. Huh. So that's that and then they're these guys were all basket makers too and they're all coilers you know they coil yeah. baskets so I think well, that was part of it. I always thought maybe it was a way of telling of um, you know differentiating between the Sunday dishes and the everyday dishes. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anyone noticed but the last coil he put on he rolled that coil out and he put it on that pot and it fit exactly. There was no overlap. He wasn't a half an inch too short, but it just fit exactly. And I think that, you know, it, every time I see you do this, Richard, it's really, really amazing. And so how long did you spend teaching? Oh, at that school, I was only there for one season. I realized it, it was a boarding school, and though I enjoyed the kids so much, I could not stand what was going on at the boarding school, so... I had, we had to leave, and that's where I met Carol, my wife. She had been teaching there, and um, so we got married that spring, and we oh, hit the road, and we had, you know, we weren't making much money at the school, obviously. <laughs> Speaking of fifty dollars, that's what we were making a month, you know, for teaching, fifty dollars a month. Fifty dollars a month. Each of us, but between us, that's a hundred bucks, so it's not yeah. bad, right? Yeah. Oh. So, <laughs> well, but out on the res, there's not a whole lot to spend it on. That's true. That that helped, you know, that yeah. we were, you know, kind of off the. I mean, we weren't exactly on the res, but we were right on the side of it. Um, but so we lived out of the our truck for a while, for about a year. We went to Idaho, worked on a ranch up there, herding cows and fixing fence and. Well, did uh, you see that again? The coil fit exactly. <laughs> well, there's a little piece left over. Oh, oh, sh hide that! <laughs> hide that! <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah, for it. You can erase that part of the yeah, tape. Yeah, we'll erase that part. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then um, we worked. Yeah, we worked up north for a while, orchards, and I lived in a little hay wagon up in Idaho. He sounds like you were just a bunch of young hippies. Yeah, except my vision of hippies were that they were lazy, and I was anything but lazy. <laughs> Hey, I wait was, a minute, I was one of those hippies. And were you a hard I wasn't working lazy. Hippie? You were a hard working hippie? <laughs> I was a hard working hippie. You have to change <laughs> okay. you have to change your image. You'll have to you'll have to say that. You'll have to use those two together then. Yeah, okay, yeah, there we hard go. Hard working. <laughs> yeah, I, at that time, you know, it's like I was my my um, heroes, you know, were those who came out of the Dust Bowl, you know, that went out west and oh. survivors, you know, these farmers that lost everything and they had their families and they they were just going to make it, you know, they were going to, so that's why I don't, you know, the idea of hippie is sitting around and smoking weed and, yeah. you know, far out, man. You know? Yeah, groovy, like, psychedelic yeah. man. <laughs> so I, I didn't really identify with that too much, but, but we did live pretty uh, sparsely. Basically. Very sparse. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And so I, we, um, after Idaho, it was getting cold up there, and so we, we went south ended up uh, south of the Superstition Mountains and set up a little camp. And in Arizona? In Arizona and uh -huh. started making little pots and selling them off the hood of the truck, you know. We'd go to the, <laughs> the Greyhound uh, racetrack where there was a swap meet and, you know, we'd just put little pots out, $6, $4, $5, whatever, you know, whatever, we can get some gas money, that would yeah. help. <laughs> well, 
you could accumulate fifty dollars a lot quicker at the that flea market than you could working for a, an entire month at that boarding school. Yeah, that's right. That's uh-huh. true. That's true. Yeah, we were making big money. Yeah. Now, does your wife make pots also? No, she's she's kind of the brains behind the operation. Yeah. She takes care of all the the finances and. Yeah. Uh, I don't even have to talk about it. It's so great. I can well, it just, just happens, create, huh? You know, yeah, it just sort of happens. Gosh. As long as I, you know, as I, I get a get my ten dollars for my birthday gift and my stick of gum. And <laughs> ten dollars and a stick of gum. <laughs> oh, and how old were you when you got this ten dollars and a stick of gum for your birthday? Sixty-six. Sixty-six. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So but, how long did it take before you could make some of the giant pots that, that I see from your past? Oh, I, I got right into those. Yeah. I, once I found, and we were living in the Southwest at the time, so we were living in Arizona, um, Ganado, Arizona, out on the Navajo Riz. And because everything dries so fast, I I could just start with just a base like this and just keep going and going and going and going and going. And at night, it just cover up the rim, cover up the the pot, and the next morning, start all over again and just keep going. So I realized that uh, this technique too, you could build any size. And so we were kind of, I was kind of drawn to the the big pieces. Hey Richard. Yeah. Quickly, Mike Eagle. Yeah, yeah. Remember that very, very big pot you made? Um, we're, oh, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Just it's so you in know. the Idle Jordan Sir? Museum. Yeah. Awesome. Sir. We're, that we're is awesome. awesome. The world. We're live that, to the world. That's cool, though. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's all right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll be finished hey. very soon, and you can chat with I Richard for the whole rest of the Yeah, yes, that was pretty neat. And thank you. Thank you for coming. And I hope you enjoy the new ones that he has here on display. Thank you. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, those, those pieces that you have produced over the years, and could you guess about how many oh, you might have made along the way? Uh, no, I don't. I, I would be terrible at guessing. I, and, of course, now I'm making a lot more smaller pieces, so... Uh, it Is seems that, like for when I was doing the large, really large pieces, I could maybe do two, two a month. You know, that was about the about the the most I could do with large pieces. And so, what we're seeing in your show this year, um, along with a, a couple of pieces that we released earlier in the year, that's your whole year's production. Pretty much. Pretty yeah, I think much. It is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, I have been working on uh, reviving some of our traditional pottery, um, our Wyandotte pottery, but that stuff, you know, it's more of our cooking pots and things like that. So, so it's more functional pieces, and also trying to help uh, some of those who are related to some of our Iroquoian kin. Um, you know, in, in the same process of building these old old style cooking pots and cooking in them. Because there's something really wonderful about that. When you're cooking uh, in a pot you've made with the food you've grown, you know, the traditional foods and using wooden spoons and there's no metal. Uh, there's just a, there's a, a, a really amazing flavor to the food. And so these are things that I've been really uh, and the water in. and the water comes out of the ground and it's right. not chlorinated. Yeah, it's spring water, uh, yeah. And, sp- and if anyone's ever had beans cooked in a clay pot, oh, yeah. it's a whole new world out there. They, it's so different and, and they're just so delicious. Yeah, and when you cook them, you know, even without a lid, you cook it in a in a pot. You know, you get a sort of a smoky taste that's just yeah. there. Yeah. Uh-huh. So <laughs> yeah, it really is. Now, are you are you now actively teaching any of your tribal members, or you know, like you did at the boarding school? Yeah, there's always occasions that come up, and sometimes they're sort of spur of the moment, and then sometimes they're planned. So, um, in September, I'll be going up to Aquasasani for uh, 
for a 10-day workshop leading You're going to, where? to Aquasasani Mohawk Reserve. Uh -huh. And um, so that's, that's one that's in the works right now. Um, but, you know, if there's a group in our area that decide, let's get together and do a class or something, um, you know, I'm open to that. You're too. the man, right? Yeah. Um, <coughs> there's a, a Quapaw woman, too, who's a friend of ours that she's, she took some classes with me for a while just to learn the firing techniques and, and some of my building techniques, too. And she's been, she's really, uh, you know, she's doing really well and she's been wanting to take some more classes. And then I have a student, too, um, who's more like an apprentice. And she's been an apprentice for about five years. And she, she still, you know, we still work together. She does a lot. Uh, and she's, she's been great. It's been great to have somebody be able to come out and, um, and pass some of these things on. And, of course, my nephew, you know, too, who uh, worked with me for a whole year. We just, we just kind of worked across the table from each other, Jamie Zane Smith. Yes. His name is Jamie Zane Smith. And, yes, we do have some of Jamie's work which is the same technique, but a very, very different interpretation, which is great. I yeah, mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, occasionally workshops will come up and um, Car Carol's been um, helpful because she's, she's been trying to, I, I, they'll ask me about, well, what do you charge for a workshop? And I'll say, <laughs> point it, <laughs> just say point it, talk yeah. to Carol. Yeah, right. I don't really you're, want to talk about money. wife slash business manager yeah because yeah. i've i've kind of gotten myself into trouble before by offering it's like oh i don't charge anything i just want people to learn you know and and then she'll come after me and say you know you, you really should charge for something you've got to charge for something well i said well you take care of that then yeah. <laughs> you just you put a price on it i don't know how to do that so she's good about that well richard we all know you're worth a million bucks <laughs> but <laughs> Um, you know, it's really fun to watch you do this, but, you know, the process continues on beyond uh, adding coils, those spaghetti-like coils, uh, to your piece of pottery. Uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about once the, the pot is its satisfactory shape, mm -hmm. what, what happens from there? And in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll ask Derek maybe to bring a finished piece over so uh, people could see them in the, the you know, in front of you. Okay. I don't, I mean, there's a television screen behind us, but I don't know if the, on the television there's any uh, finished pieces there. And, not at the moment. Not at the moment, so here we go. There you oh there you go. Now you get to see all of the the pieces that we have of Richards for this show. Uh, but if you notice there are places that are really smooth and places that have uh, designs look like they're pressed into them and there are pieces that have cutouts. rundown on how all that happens. Okay, uh, for the color, what I do is I start with a clay that's pretty much the same as the clay I'm building. It might come from a different source, but it's similar. Now, do you dig your own clay? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, this particular clay is from Oklahoma. Um, it's a place that I, uh, I gather it. It's at a, in a Cherokee um, allotment from this woman whose family has lived there for ever since they, they were forced out of uh, you know, from the east, uh, but uh, she's just so delighted to be able to share the clay, you know, and uh, they always come out and help me dig too, and I always tell them, it's like, you guys don't have to help dig, <laughs> it's hot out, it's like, no, we want to be a part of it, uh, so that's been really great, yeah. um, so, and the clay is just beautiful, it's, uh, it's actually kind of a, a yellowy green color, I add a little bit of iron to it just for the color, so that's why this is a little browner color. But, but anyway, that's the, the clay now. The is, is the clay really polluted with roots and grass and rocks? and? Yeah, it, it usually has a lot of roots and things in and it. And how do you get uh, rid of them? Well, what I do is we pick it out of the ground dry after we give thanks and we do our, our, our songs and, and prayers and offerings and stuff. And we... Um, 
we take the, uh, the clay home and put it out on some big plywood sheets uh, and let it sun dry, just let it bake really, uh, real well in the sun. And then once I feel like it's completely dry, that's when I either store it or I'll take some of that dry clay and start dropping it in water. And the water will just, it just starts breaking down, just crumbles it all up. So the, so any organic stuff comes to the top and then the rocks go to the bottom. So uh, it's fairly simple uh, to mix clay, it just takes time. And I, I'm one who just likes to let the water do most of the work. So um, I soak it, skim off the organic material, and then um, mix it up real good thoroughly, and then pour it through a screen. So I pour mine through an 80 mesh screen, so it's, it's very fine. Um, when I'm doing the paints, the paints will go through a 20, uh, 200 mesh screen. So I want it to be real smooth, so when you brush it with a tiny brush, you know, it, it, this, it just has real nice lines. It doesn't have any gritty stuff in it or anything. No so, blurps at the yeah, end, Yeah, huh? no blurps. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but yeah, the, there's also one batch of clay that I got from Arizona. I still use it for slips too. It just makes a pretty good slip. So I've just, and I've still got so much of it. You know, I've got a five gallon container. You mean those old hippie days at the flea market? That, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, where it's from? It was from those eras. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah. So yeah, that would have been back in 79 and eight, yeah, 79. Well, I, I probably should say back in those old hardworking hippie days yeah. Yeah, in yeah, Arizona. Before. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you put that on there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> really. Yeah. And so the you use basically the clay, but the clay isn't that, you know, those blues and greens and grays right. and oranges. What do you do to, to, you know, get that coloration? Yeah, so the, the oranges come from natural clays that I, I go find. Um, there's certain spots that I'll, I'll visit every couple of years and, you know, just get a, a little a bucket of it or so. Um, the reds are usually the, this color, it's the same clay. Uh, and then I mix iron oxide. So I look for a real red iron oxide. Red iron oxide. Yeah. Um, the blues, that's when you, uh, that's when I go to mason stains, blues and greens. Um, so mason stains are a ceramic stain that's it's basically created from minerals and, you know, they're not going to give you their recipe, right? So, yeah. <laughs> but they, they sell them already pretty dependable and reliable. So uh, you mix, I, I mix, when I mix a, a stained clay, that clay has to be at least 50% clay, you know, and then uh, if it's, it, it can be up to 50% uh, stain, but it, that's about as high as you can go. Otherwise, it'll flake off, you know. So, when it's fired. <clears throat> so, so, is that stain applied before or after your f you do your firing? There's a couple of different techniques I've used. The the, the way I started out was just one once firings, once fired pots, and that would be so I'd just take and paint the the stains on, or the slips on, um, just after it's dry. But I've also, in the last maybe 10 years, I've been doing multiple firings. So um, I'll fire the piece first, just a uh, biscuit. Yeah. And then I'll actually spray on a black uh, slip. And that black slip, when, when that's fired, I fire that up to a pretty hot you know, temperature. But if I may interrupt, when you talk about the firing, are you firing in the ground or are you firing in a kiln? Well, uh, for the colorful pieces, those are pretty much all done in electric kiln. Uh huh. Because uh, you get the clean, oxidized color and that. So, um, yeah, the, the more traditional, the cooking pots and all those kind of things, that's where I do the outside firings. Uh, but for most part, unless I'm doing some of those, like the handled pieces, I've done handled ones, you know, with the with a, a root, you know, or something. And some of those, I'll, I like the fire to kind of have its way with the pot. So th those I, I might fire outside. But it's really, the clay is mixed um, 
with a very fine temper here. So this would be a clay that I'd use um, to be fired in the electric kiln because there's no shock so much. And to it. Maybe we should explain what temper is and what its effect is on the clay body. Okay, yeah. So yeah, the temper is like an aggregate that it's almost like what's put in concrete to keep keep uh, when the concrete shrinks around the uh, the rock or whatever it keeps is it, it from gravel. Yeah, yeah it's, like uh -huh. gravel. So it, it, it acts the same way because clay has a pretty high shrinkage. So um, so it so when you add ground up stone, um, there's uh, pottery shirts can be crushed to make it something that's already been fired, uh, something that won't shrink basically is what you want. Uh, so that gives something for the clay to shrink around and, and, and hold its form. It also helps during the firing too, because the firing can be really, uh, outdoor firings especially, can be pretty hard on pieces. <clears throat> and when I do a traditional firing, I don't cover them with tin or anything. It's just, it's just I do it you know, the, the really old way because I wanted to do it as close as the way the ancestors did it. So it's just the wood is touching the pots. You know? uh, so that, you have to have at least 30% temper, which uh, when I do those, it'd be like crushed granite, like some of the granite that I get here. You know? so, uh, and that, that's a traditional temper that was used by my ancestors in Ontario. Uh, crushed granite is kind of a favorite. Um, here, I also use um, a flint. It's a crushed flint, but I buy it because it's really dangerous to crush that stuff by yourself and breathe it. So I, I get it pre-ground. Uh, so that works pretty well for me. There's also uh, a temper which is called kyanite. Kyanite, and it's a good temper for outdoor firings too because it's it's like almost like mica, but it's in uh, it's shaped more like they say needles, but they're not. That's kind of scary to think of. But they're not really needles. They're more like little. Uh, if you could look at them in a microscope, they'd be like that. You know, kind of this kind of a shape, just a, a elongated rocks. So when they break apart, they're like more little elongated rocks, and they and they're really good for uh, for uh, raku or outdoor firing pits. So that works pretty good. Uh, pottery shirt stuff I haven't used as much. I don't get a lot of pottery shirts. <laughs> and no. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of well, failure. So that way, um, um, with as we using temper, the in the local area, people here use pottery shirts mm -hmm. because um, they're available, yep. and I don't think they. Uh, go to the extent that you do to experiment because you know that's sort of part of the the tradition uh, of using the pottery shirts that that you know you find all over the the southwest right and so what the temper does is it helps stabilize the clay during the shrinkage uh while you're firing and right. for the most part you fire you kiln fire them in an electric kiln uh, and you do some ground fire. Good. Right, so now we can go on from there. Yeah. So that yeah. So it's two different extremes, really. The electric firing is just completely clean atmosphere, and then when I do what I call a traditional firing, there's no metal at all used at all in the firing. So uh, they're just just the wood and the pottery, uh, and that's it. They touch everything touches. So. And clay, you know, because I do lay down sherds over the coals, but... And, and uh, how hot do you think that fire gets to be? Or how hot do you need it to be? For an outdoor firing? For any t any firing that you do. Oh, boy. Uh, I mean, is it 200 <laughs> degrees or 2,000 degrees? Uh, I think it's like, if you can get up to 1,800, you're pretty good. Now, you know, when... when, when when you get up that high, things begin to change. You know, the, the surface will change, like a, a very glossy, shiny, burnished surface will start to become duller. Um, uh, so it depends on what you want, you know, what, what you're after. If you're looking for uh, color and, you know, you want to keep a glossy surface, a burnished surface, then you have to make sure they're red heat 
and just maybe just a little edging past red heat into orange heat. But uh, if you get too hot, they'll, you'll lose the burnish. And so it's kind of a, part of it is just eyeing it. I like to fire, when I do an outdoor firing, I fire at night. So all day I'm drying the pots. Um, and then in the, at that last, uh, just before the sun comes down, that's when I, I'll put the pots in. But they've been drying all around the fire. Uh, and I thump them like this. I just thump those pots. And if they're starting to ring, they have kind of a ring to them. Uh -huh. I know they're ready to go in. Huh. So they have to they have to ring though. I won't put them in otherwise. Yeah. And and how fragile is that pot right before you fire it? Uh, they're they're pretty fragile. Yeah. They'll. I mean, obviously, you know, you can't put water in it, or you wouldn't be able to. Uh, you wouldn't be able to cook with a pot that's unfired. However, it's really interesting because when I've been doing shell temper, where the, uh, the shell, you know, mussel shell was used, you know, some of the ancient cultures in Ohio, Kentucky, a lot of, the, uh, a lot of them preferred using these. And you, know, you, you bake it until it just crumbles apart and then you crush it up. Um, when you add it to the clay, it's almost like mica. This stuff... Huh. It, it, it comes out in little flakes. So the flakes bond really good with the clay. And so you can stretch that clay really thin, really nice and thin, just like a lot of the uh, mica, micaceous clay can be stretched. Uh, but you can't fire it too hard, so you have to be really careful about that. Um, with uh, any kind of shell temper, you, you have to get red heat, That's you're done. You take it out. As soon as it's, it reaches red heat, you pull and those pots out. What will happen if you don't? Uh, if you don't, the pot will just start disintegrating. It, you could have it sitting someplace and all of a sudden a piece will fall off or a piece. You'll start seeing these little pits first and then, you know, then, you know the rim will start melting. <laughs> it's, just, it's great to take a picture of because it's... Well, it's some like, time-lapse photography oh, yeah, might be yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah Especially sure. if you did it in the opposite direction and it just Building came it. all <laughs> came together again. That what, would be fun. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of experimenting... I'm doing too, and part of it is working with some archaeologists. We're trying to uncover things that, uh, trying to uncover some of the secrets of the ancients, the, you know, of my ancestors, and and also some of those from uh, the Ohio area, Ohio and Kentucky. So it's it's been it's been really interesting. Well, you know, we think of pottery as being a Southwest um, art craft, utilitarian object. Uh, was that the same case in the East Coast? Yeah, they sure were, yeah. Um, some of my ancestors made pots that were just massive, just massive pots. And um, they're not sure if they were used for cooking. Or storage? Or storage. This is the thing. You know, I think maybe a lot of them might have been storage pots because uh, they were, you know, they were longhouse people. Uh, they grew corn. The women did the corn, they grew the corn and the beans, uh, the squash. And so they needed, a, needed containers, you know, to store all that corn for winter, those long winters. So I think they might have been shelled, you know, and then all the corn was stored in these massive containers like that. And they were maybe buried half in the ground, you know. And, uh, but there's another way of testing it too now. They're doing is uh, residue testing, where they can scrape off a little charcoal on the pot and see if that was something was cooked in there, and find out uh -huh. exactly what was cooked in it. The DNA of the corn. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing what's been done, uh, and what they're doing right now. So another project I'm working with some wind out up in Quebec, and uh, with some archaeologists in Ontario. And, and tell me, tell me why Canada? Oh yeah, that's our homeland. That's my. My ancestral homelands, we call it uh, Mandagi Yehe. Mandagi Yehe is the, the place of our, the old uh, place of our, old, old homelands, I guess. So when, when our ancestors were still making pottery and, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, some of the archaeologists, you know, they're, they're exposed to all the sherds. You know, they, they're pulling them out of the ground all the time. Or, or they're studying them, but they've never really worked with pottery before. So uh, to we're kind of connecting, because I'm the guy who's the hands-on guy. And so 
<clears throat> I'm actually helping them to to help with their, some of their theories about how pottery styles, you know, one group of people would move to another and they'd all of a sudden a, a pottery style would change and it would start, you'd start seeing influences from this other group of people over here. And so we're trying to document some of that, some of those changes, some of the technique differences, like um, on some of my ancestors' pots that had a collar around the, uh, the, the rim. And you have pot, and you do pots with collars around the rim. Right. And, and some of them have found that um, the, the collar is actually made of a smoother clay, or it's applied, a smoother clay has been applied over it. And there's a reason for that, because when you, when you drag a bone tool you know, across clay that has grit in it, you know, it's kind of, you know, rough. But boy, when you have a nice creamy clay and you drag a tool, you can get these beautiful lines, you know, straight horizontal lines. So that's one thing that... Uh, I'm experimenting with right now and working on a project with them. So they sent me clay from some ancestral homeland sites, some of our old homeland sites, and that's been nice to be able to work with clay that my ancestors would have used. Richard, you know, speaking of a bone tool, do you think you could tell us a little bit about all the tools that you have in front of you? I mean, we saw a shell, and briefly we just saw this bone. I think it's oh, yeah. a bone flyby. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. Maybe you could tell us about the various tools, because I think people might be very interested in how, um, let's say, can, easy to find and convenient, and, and without being a derogatory, primitive, right. uh, the tools are. Yeah, um, I'm one that really believes that a lot of tools had multi-purposes, you know, so uh, on some of the really ancient stuff, especially around the Great Lakes area, you'll see, often you'll see indentations on the pot rims that have this kind of a, a little pattern, like these little uh, dotted lines. You'll see that <clears throat> on a lot of pottery. Um, and I, I have, my theory is that these were already in place. They were using these for cleaning, um, they were for taking the flesh off of small hides. You know, when you have a hide stretched and you're working off that, that meat, so you have these little teeth on there and it gives you that uh, extra to pull, help pull that, that fat off, you know, so you can clean a hide. So, and also hairpins, you know, that women would wear uh, just a bone tool that they'd have their hair pinned up in and they could just take it out when they needed it and you know, use it as a tool. So uh, there's a lot of things I think were used for many different purposes. Now that bone resided in what kind of animal? Uh, they find deer, deer for the longest pieces, sometimes elk um, for solid, you know, like really thick bone pieces, elk. Uh, um, I don't know that they really found much buffalo, evidence of buffalo in our area, but uh, that, that's something I would ask our archeologists about if you're wanting really thick bone tools. But uh, so, so tooth, you know, teeth, uh, things like this. We'll also see this up in, um, up in Canada too, where the design on the castellation is actually printed out with, with, a, with a tool like that. Instead of just drawing, dragging a bone tool to make those lines they would actually imprint like this and get that little dotted line and, and they I don't know they're really clean very clean and sometimes you can actually see like on an edge like the edge of a pot you'll see this on top where you'll see indentation like this and when you see that you can actually see uh, a gap between two pieces of bone is the same. It's being repeated as you go down, you know. So you realize it's from one tool. It's not just uh, something rubbed on it or rolled on it. So <clears throat> you see that kind of texture. It seems like little edges like this were always played around. They could not leave the edges alone. They, had to just put, <laughs> they just had to continually put more and more. And sometimes on the inside of the pot, you'll see where they even worked down inside the, the pod and, and uh, put designs down in, down into it. Kind of like when you hold a, a, a styrofoam cup, you know, and you're sitting talking to somebody yeah. and you start pinching it and yeah. <laughs> yeah. you get all these designs. Oh, that's kind of nice. <clears throat> and then you don't want to throw it away. 
but that that's a that's a common uh, kind of design you'll see in uh, the Lake Erie area around where Lake Erie is. You'll see those on sherds that washed up on the beaches. Well, one of the pots that we have in the case uh, that uh, we released earlier in the year is called the Spirit of the Ancestors. And I believe that tool was used to make the oh. texture in, in that, that piece. Could be, uh -huh. yeah, could be. And maybe, Derek, you could go get that pot out of the case and we can all take a look at it. Yeah. Oh, so what's that funny thing that, you know, is sort of... Uh, like a shoehorn. Oh yeah, this one right here. Yeah, this this is a, a piece of cow horn. And I like to use this one for smoothing on the inside. Um, it's got all these different shapes. It's got sh curved shapes going this way, if I was smoothing something that way. Inside, and it's light. So if I drop it, if I drop it inside the pot, it won't, uh, you know, it won't do any damage. Oh. But a, a shell works too, pretty good like that. So I'm going to look for the curves on it. Uh, I picked up this one on the beach, in, on a beach in, uh, in um, Aotearoa in uh, New Zealand. And this one is great too, it has a great curve on it for, for smoothing on the inside. If you want the whole world to hear it, <laughs> it's, it's right. It's, so it's, I just want you, uh, this is very naive. Um, the, your texture of your pots is so beautiful and very unique. How do you get that texture on the outside? This is just from uh, adding coils, just fine coils every that's time. That's really what you do. Huh? Yeah, that's. And then you don't quite smooth them so so slick. Right. Okay. So the inside is less. If, if I may repeat the question, because uh, the question was asked a little far away from the microphone. Yeah, all muffled. That that um, the question was, how does Richard get the um, the texture on the outside of the pot that he's you know so well known for? And if, Richard, if you want to explain how, uh, that would be great. Yeah. So the texture is caused by just building the, the pot. So, so I'm rolling these small coils. And when I roll the coil, I'll just do a short one here so I can show you. Um, the coil is not just stacked, you know, like the way we were taught in high school, you just stack coil. It's put on the side. Okay, so, so when it, and I'll I'll swing the, I'll swing it around, so it's put actually below the rim. Uh -huh. See, so so that's the coil's actually laid on below the actual rim itself, and then uh, it's flattened on. I see, and then you kind of push up. <laughs> yeah, by by flattening it, you're actually creating the space for the next coil above it. So that's how it grows. So this piece could be, could just keep going, you know, just get, it can get bigger. So every I mean, single line that you see on the, on the exterior of that pot is an individual coil that has been individually applied. Did you just come across this by accident or were you experimenting with this idea? Or? No, we've already covered that earlier okay. on, in this program uh, where we talked about uh, Rich, Richard's experience as a teacher and uh, being very, very interested in his tribal ancestry and going out and searching the, the sherds of the countryside, uh, so, coordinating with anthropologists and archaeologists, and then experimenting on his own. So yeah, this is an ancient southwestern technique of building uh, that uh, archaeologists call corrugated. And, so this is the, the technique and, right there. And Richard, if you want to put this in... Oh, uh, better not. Well, <laughs> better not let's, touch let's it. Let's see if we have this in the camera view, oh. probably. This is the one I was talking... Let's see if this is the one I was talking about with the spirit of the ancestors and how he had used that bone tool to make the texture. Oh, there we go. Now you can see it. Thank you. Thank you. And so let's let's talk continue on about the coloration. 
because that fascinates me. You have a whole palette of colors that um, are, you know, that you don't think of as being traditional ceramic pieces unless they come from some manufactured glazing factory. Uh, and so how are some of those uh, uh, colors, how, where do they originate? Okay, like some of them are, uh, some of the oranges and reds are ones that I gather myself, but the, the ones like the blues and the greens, these come from um, uh, stains, ceramic stains that are actually produced for ceramics. Um, and you know, you can't use the stain by itself, it has to be mixed with clay, otherwise it won't stick. Won't st uh, a stain is basically just ground up rock, you know, so uh, they, and also rock that's been fired, so they know it's, it's color fast. It knows, you know, it's gonna be, the, it'll be the same each time. So, uh, yeah, the, there's companies that sell these, you know, ceramic stains. And they, uh, some potters will use it and mix it into their clays completely, just mix the stains in. So you can actually have uh, blue clays or red clays or green clays and, and they blend them all together. Um, I just, I use it more as a, for my slips, my paints. And so it's all been sieved and, uh, and mixed with clay, dry clay, powdered pulverized clay and the clay is is passed through a 200 mesh screen so it's very fine so when i do a, a series of colors or shading what i'll do is i'll have uh i'll use the gram scale and i'll have all these little containers like nine different shades so i'll start with black on one side and i'll start with the red on the other and what I'll do is I'll start mixing percentages all the way down huh. with the gram scale until, they, until it flips over. So, yeah, so it's uh, uh, 25, uh, you know, of this, and then it's 25 of that. Yeah, that's your first, and then it just starts slowly changing until, the, until, you, until you have all these shades in between. And that way it gives you all that, that range of color. And then when you have that range of color, you can actually, you can go from then from that red to you know, to an orange, you know, go from that orange to something else, to a blue. So they all get tied together. And because you're I'm mixing, I'm mixing these stains and oxides with a, a clay, my clay base, they all stay kind of related to one another. They're not too overpowering. The color doesn't just, you know. Become... Well, there's lots of gradation in yeah. the staining that you do. Have you ever run out of a color? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh -huh. that, and you know that's one nice thing about having it all mixed in by, with a gram scales. Like if one of my colors disappears or getting low, I can always mix it again, and it'll fit right in with all the shading. So, yeah. Whereas if it's kind of haphazard, if I just do it on the top of the table, you know, mix colors, I'll never be able to get that again. <laughs> Now, as you move closer and closer to the knowledge you've gained about your ancestors, and oh, by the way, when did when did your ancestors uh, head south and come to America and leave Canada? Yeah. yeah. Well, it wasn't a it wasn't a plan. I'll tell you that. that uh, <laughs> they didn't plan on that happening. Uh, it was yeah. It was it was a tough time back in the 1600s. Um, there was the smallpox epidemics were going on. The Jesuit missionaries were coming in, blaming, basically blaming the medicine people for bringing the diseases. The medicine people were blaming the, the French for bringing them in. And so the, the nations became really split and divided. You know, so you had these Christian groups and then you had non-Christian groups. And they started to become really hostile to each other. Um, because each one was blamed basically all the, the horrors on the other. So when they were weakened like that, and we're talking about a 30,000 uh, group of people, 30,000 individuals wow. as a confederacy, the whole confederacy, uh, it just became split, split down the middle. 
there were some Wendat people who were so discouraged about their own villages that they left and they joined the Senecas and they joined other Iroquoian groups because the languages are so similar. Um, and it's been said that it's been some of these that actually led the people to our villages up in, up in the, our homelands, which was north of Toronto. Um, and at that time, it was, uh, it was, there had been a lot of blood feuds. It was a terrible time. So the whole nation split. One side went with the Jesuits back to Quebec area for protection. And the other group uh, joined uh, some other longhouse people, the Eries and the Neutrals and the uh, Tiananmen people and Ottawa's, which were a different language people, but they were trading partners. And they went, headed west. Um, and they were basically kind of living on the road for at least 20, 30 years. And they ended up down in um, um, the Detroit area. What's Detroit now? And of course, it was just a fort at that time. And it was a place, a trading place. So there were a lot of tribes would come to the fort to trade. Um, some settled there and stayed, and others w found that uh, Ohio was empty at that time, and they decided to, to take residence there. So they went into central Ohio, what's known now as uh, Upper Sandusky, and settled it, settled that area. <clears throat> so that's where they were when they were forced out during the Indian Removal Act. They were in Ohio. So they were forced out of Ohio in 1843. They settled Kansas, right where Kansas City, uh, the, the Kansas River joins the Missouri. And uh, our old cemetery is still there. Fortunately, we had some, some of our, my own family members really stood up for that place and, and protected it with their lives. And one of them was Lida Conley. She, she actually went and got her law degree so that she could fight it in courts. She, uh, she and her sister would paddle across the Missouri River every morning so she could go to school. And wow. So you know this was an all-men's school, too, for the most part. So I'm sure she was hassled not only for being Native, but also for being a woman at a law school, going to a law school. And she something, got her diploma. Some things never change. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> She got her diploma, and the first case she brought was to protect that cemetery. Oh, and uh, her first wonderful. attempt failed, but the second, it was appealed, and she got protection for it. Wow. So we were all excited about that. My mom remembers them a little bit, the Connolly sisters. And uh, there's a lot been you know, written about them. <clears throat> there's even a couple of, there's a, a woman right now looking into doing a, a play. There was a, actually a film was going to be made, but the person who was wanting to do the film, um, they, they were given some grief because the person didn't look very native who was playing light as part. But the funny thing is, is our why not people didn't look that native anyway. So it's like to be more accurate, she probably, she would have looked better. If she was Italian, she'd have looked better. She would have looked better. She's she would have looked more yeah, Wyandotte right, right. than... Uh, right. Or part of the image. Yeah, more yeah. of the, the true yeah. image of what uh -huh. a Wyandotte was back in the you know, early 1900s. What, so. what, when you're stopping with that coil, Richard, we've brought up something for you to clean your hands. And we would love to end this wonderful time that we've spent with you. Uh, enjoying learning about your history. I mean, I think it's amazing. I know my relatives came from Eastern Europe, and that's it. One <laughs> that's sentence, it. and there, there you go. Wow. And it's just magical hearing about all these family stories and, and how you uh, do this exciting and wonderful and absolutely beautiful pottery. And it's a joy and an honor to know you, and it's even more fascinating to hear you, and I wish this could go on forever and ever, but uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to sign off pretty soon, and perhaps we can pick up again where we left off next year, uh, when we when for, when you know we can maybe do this again. 
but there is some there's a towel there that maybe you oh, okay. can wipe your hands on and I see the drums sitting behind you and if you wouldn't mind uh, ending this program with some drumming and a song that sure. would be absolutely wonderful yeah I can do that <clears throat> thank you Jamais. <clears throat> can I take the mask off for singing <laughs> um, yeah sure why not we'll break the rules for I, I don't know if I can sing with her so this is our uh, water drum traditional water drum and why not we say yadakwa yadakwa I'm gonna just for, yeah okay so hey, now you get to see he has a real face I have a real face he's a real face I can even smile <laughs> <laughs> I didn't shave because I didn't think I'd have to <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, yeah this is uh, one of our traditional uh, instruments water drum and they were made out of clay in the past, uh, they were also made of wood too. So uh, I think it would be appropriate, since we were talking about my my uh, relatives who fought for the cemetery, our cemetery protection, to do a wind out woman's dance, and I'll uh, sing a couple of these. These are really old songs too. I learned these by listening to old songs that were recorded by a 85 year old back in 1911 and 12. Thank you so much, and thank you for being who you are. Well, it's thank a, you. We really appreciate you know working with you, and it's just so wonderful to uh, to bring pots in and have them so you know well received and with love and happiness and oh. exciting, and, and that you get to do the work that we're not very good at doing, and so we're just really happy to uh, to work with you. Really appreciate it. Everything you do. Well, you we know. are partners in this world. And thank you for everything you do and who you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.